Hey everyone, me Kevin here with 10 really stupid mistakes that almost everybody makes when they buy real estate and if there's anything we can get out of this video, it's that you should consider trying not to make these mistakes if you get into real estate or you're thinking about adding more to your real estate portfolio. All of these things and many, many, many more are obviously things that I cover in my amazing real estate investing course, which has over 400 lecture style videos just like this, over 400 of them, it comes with live streams and that's in addition to the real estate sales course and the real estate property management and rental renovations course. Check those out, link down below. You'll save a lot of money. But at a time, folks, when the Wall Street Journal says the National Association of Realtors finds that prices are up 12% year over year nationwide and some areas like Crestview, Florida and Bridgeport, Connecticut are seeing home prices jump 27%. We need to talk about the big 10 mistakes that people consistently make when it comes to real estate. And what I encourage you to do is consider taking out a notepad and writing down things that the pros do and avoiding the things that the newbies do. All right, folks, with that said, let's get started. First thing that I like to talk about, people walk into a house. Noobs usually walk in and the first thing they do is, okay, Let's rip out the bathrooms. Let's rip out the kitchen. Let's open up the walls and let's take out all the light fixtures and everything. And let's take out all the doors while we're at it. And if we're going to take out the doors, we may as well put in new door casings and let's do everything brand new. Flooring, gone. New baseboards, you got it. Perfect. Get rid of everything. This is a very, very newbie mistake. Now, this is, it's one thing if you're going to go in and you're a professional flipper and you have a formula and you've done this many times before. It's quite another to be a novice and go into a rental property and say, take everything out and they'll, then we'll come up with a plan. Why is that so dangerous? It's dangerous because real estate is so easy to overspend on. People have all these sayings like, when in doubt, take it out. And it basically means you walk into a renovation and no matter what you buy, you end up ripping out more than you actually think you need to. And this is a big problem. A pro goes from a completely different angle or takes a completely different approach for creating rental property investments. Now, this is different. Obviously, if you're building your dream home, you're not going to follow this step. But for 99% of us watching this video, we're trying to build our wealth. We're trying to make money. So even if this means we're moving into our first home, you should follow the same steps. A pro walks into a project and says, okay, instead of when in doubt, take it out, what can I do on a sort of marginal basis to spend as little money as possible to make something safe and beautiful? And so here are just a couple of classic examples. Noob walks into kitchen, let's rip everything out. Pro walks into a kitchen and says, okay, we haven't had any major water damage in this kitchen. There's no mildew behind the cabinets, which we could see oftentimes by looking uh, under the kitchen sink to see if there's been water damage. We can remove the kick plates from under the cabinets and inspect cabinets for any kind of warping or mildew. The kitchen appears to be in excellent condition in terms of its structure. I mean, wood cabinets generally don't decay unless they've rotted. Why, instead of tearing everything out, don't we just do a light sand on the cabinets and paint the cabinets? Same thing with the bathroom vanities. What do we save now? Well, we save redoing the drywall on the, uh, uh, all the drywall work that's behind the cabinets, which would get damaged if you took out the cabinets. A lot of people damage all the drywall and then they say, well, while I'm putting in new cabinets, let's just put in new drywall. And while I'm doing that, let's put in new uh, under cabinet lights. And you know what? Since we're doing drywall work and we're doing electrical, let's do can lights in the kitchen. And while we're doing that, why don't we add USB outlets and while we're doing that, why don't we go put a refrigerator water line in? And while we're doing that, why don't we put in a second dishwasher? Because who wouldn't want a second dishwasher? Now, obviously, I'm, I'm getting a little extreme there going down the sort of slippery slope. But that's the problem with real estate is when you do one thing, you usually end up doing another thing. A pro walks in saying, what are the least amount of decisions that I can make up front? to minimize the odds of me having to do more and more and more. You go into a bathroom, you paint the cabinet, you change the little knobs, you put in a light fixture and you change the fart fan, boom, you're pretty much done. You wanna change the toilet? Fine, do that. Don't like the color of the shower? Well, let's see. If I rip out the whole shower, now I gotta flood a, uh, you know, float a new shower pan. Somebody's gotta come and frame it out. They're gonna wanna make sure the walls are level and square, which that means the walls have to be furred out. Then you gotta put up the hardy backer or the installation panel system that you use. Then you gotta tile it, you gotta grout it, you gotta cure the grout. What about the plumbing valves? All of that could freaking be avoided if you go in and just 
do what the pro does. Uh uh uh. We're not gonna do when in doubt, take it out. We're just gonna clean it up and make it look beautiful. Now, this is very, very quickly confused by many people with, well, I don't wanna cheap out or I don't wanna do unsafe work. But notice nothing that I said was unsafe work. In fact, when I go into a property and there is no bathroom vent fan and we add a new bathroom vent fan, that is adding to the health and safety of the property. When we put GFCI outlets or tamper resistant outlets in, that adds to the health and safety of the property. But I'm not going in running a ton of new circuits. So there's that difference between upgrading, which noobs like to do, and updating, which pros like to do. Pros, update. Noobs, upgrade. Huge difference. Upgrade costs lots of money. Update is inexpensive. And both can be safe. Big mistake number two that people make. They get themselves a tenant and they don't screen credit. Yes, I get people who roll their eyes every single day about this. They're like, oh, but Kevin, come on. They have a good job or they've got, you know, money in the bank or, you know, I like the look of their family or I saw them on Facebook and they look great or, or look, they showed me all this cash that they have right now that they can give me, flashing the cash. <sighs> the amount of people that end up getting screwed because they highly, highly undervalue proper credit screening, which can be done very, very easily. You can go to mysmartmove.com. You can use, run credit through Zillow as a landlord. Super easy to do. The amount of people that don't actually consider reading a credit report, which evidences somebody's actual payment history for the last seven to 10 years is shocking. And when we look at a credit report, we have to realize that somebody's capacity for paying their bills over the last seven to 10 years is an indicator as to how they will pay when it comes to paying you on time for rent. On time payments matter. How they take care of their finances sometimes can translate over to how they take care of a property. Now, not always, not always. I do not wanna say that there are not good people with horrible credit. I, I personally know people with 550 credit scores that are the cleanest people that take the best care of property. Uh, properties that they're ever in and they are wonderful. They will for free upgrade properties for landlords. They're great people and I get that, that exists. But credit is a measure of risk. And a noob says, ah, credit score, schmedit score. A pro says, mm, mm credit is a statistically proven method of increasing my odds of having no evictions and no problems. And so pros use credit. Noobs use Facebook. All right. Let's keep moving on to the next one. Cash mistake number three is cash flow over location. So this is what commonly happens when people start getting the real estate bug and they start going hunting for rental properties. And what they like to do is they look, they do kind of do a little map search and they go, all right, here's all the real estate sort by cheapest. And then all of a sudden they end up in the most developing neighborhoods. And for some reason, they're buying properties in areas that they would not live in themselves. This is what noobs do. They go, oh, this is in a really bad part of town, but I'm gonna buy it anyway because the cash flow is good. The pro looks at this and says, yeah, mm, what about the most three in, the three most important rules when it comes to real estate? Location, location, location. There's a reason location is so important. Location is so important because location attracts high quality tenants. High quality tenants create less damage, less headache, are more likely to pay rent on time, are more likely to stay longer, are more likely to reduce management intensiveness over maybe a lower quality area with slightly higher cash flow. And noobs don't recognize all of the extra, extra sort of extra issues that come up when you own rental property. Pros look at how can I build my wealth in a safe and secure way with minimal headache? And that is a big difference between noobs and pros. We hear location, 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 and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you start looking at cash flow, and oftentimes you get noobs going, mm, location just doesn't matter. I want that cash flow. And then five years later, there are those people giving you all the anecdotes in the comments section of YouTube or elsewhere going, oh my gosh, tenants and toilets, screw that. Why would I bother? Here's another one. Number four. Well, you don't know what's behind the walls when you're buying a place, so you may as well take down all the walls. 
Yeah, people literally say that when they're doing renovations. Now this is similar to the first one, but you will literally have noobs come in and say, let's just strip everything, take a house down to the studs, and they'll hire contractors to get give them estimates. And the contractors will say, well, we're, you know, we're gonna be best positioned to know what to do in this property if we just strip the house. Let's just start over on the inside and we'll do all the cosmetics correctly and perfectly. That's a pretty newbie mistake because pros come into a property and they say, hey, look, I don't know what's behind the walls, but I know the neighborhood and I know how to inspect a property. And the cool thing is, usually if you've got mildew and mold or water damage behind the walls, guess what happens? You see evidence of that on the inside of the walls, the, the side that we can see. What if there are termites? Well, usually you see kickouts somewhere around the property. This is why we have termite inspections. What if there are electrical issues? Usually you see those just by even sometimes operating electrical devices, but even using a multimeter to verify you've got the correct voltages, to verify your voltage drop isn't insane, to make sure you've got receptacles that are grounded, and if they're not grounded, are, there G are they GFCI protected? So all of a sudden, before you rip open the walls, as a pro, you can start diagnosing electrical and plumbing issues. You could run a camera from the roof through the vent stack to get into the plumbing arteries of the house and go out to the street and determine what is the aging condition of our sewer line. And all of a sudden you look and go, well, gee, maybe I don't need to rip open all the walls to just notice that there's kind of what I expected in the walls. <laughs> Usually it's not as bad uh, as you think. And the whole what's behind the walls being so concerning and we should remove all the walls sales pitch that noobs get suckered into, very good way to waste all your money. Oftentimes we also get questions like, hey, well, what about the foundation? There are also red flags you can look at when it comes to foundations inside a property. When, there's, when there are foundation issues, you generally see large cracks, large enough to fit a pen or pencil in, that are around the foundation perimeter of the property. Sometimes you'll see on the inside of the property, large cracks by doors and windows. Sometimes doors close by themselves or don't stay open when, they're, when, when you open them, unless of course they're self-closing. That's totally different, obviously. Uh, and sometimes you'll see uh, total settlement in, in rooms where you'll walk in a room and you feel the house sloping down into a corner or into a different direction direction. Those are red flags that you can see without having to tear things open. Number five, big mistake that a lot of newbies make is they look at a roof and they make an assumption and a conclusion about it. Uh, and most of the time the conclusion is, oh my gosh, we have to replace the roof. Generally, my recommendation is, and this is what pros do, is they call a roofer and they get a roof tune-up. A roof tune-up can mean a roofer goes up and replaces damaged shingles and seals up protrusions along the property's uh, roof line and uh, where there are any kind of vent snacks or whatever and solves preventive or preemptively potential issues that could come up. Roof tune-up is such a great way to save money and noobs will generally call a roofer and go, how's the roof? And get a response like, you need to replace the roof and they replace the roof. A pro goes, I'd like to hire you to do a roof tune-up. <laughs> they get a roof tune-up. So you kind of get what you asked for in real estate. Newbie mistake number six, mortgage insurance. Oh my gosh. Noobs think mortgage insurance is the end of the world and they will save up 20% and never get into real estate because they'll never end up getting to that 20% because they're fearful of mortgage insurance. The reality is a buyer who buys a good deal in real estate, which I teach exactly how to do in my real estate investing course, link down below. When you get a good deal in real estate, mortgage insurance does not matter because even if you put 5% down, you end up paying about 1% more in your interest rate. You generally only pay mortgage insurance, that extra 1% for one to three years, because generally in one to three years, as long as you build your equity via principal pay down and some modest appreciation, you can generally refinance or get rid of your mortgage insurance once you build the equity in the property. So this way, it's kind of like you're replacing your landlord, you're taking control of real estate, and while you're building up to that 20%, the market is helping you build up to your 10% the or your 20% down. The market is also helping you pay down your principal by owning, you pay down your principal every single month, your principal and interest payments, and your equity in the property grows. So now it's almost like you're forced saving your way up to getting rid of mortgage insurance. And most people end up getting rid of mortgage insurance well within five years. Pros know that, noobs don't. Noobs sit down and do a calculation and say, Oh my gosh, if I do mortgage insurance, that's gonna cost me X thousands of dollars over 30 years. Dude, you ain't gonna have the loan for 30 years. 
Let's be real. Most people refinance within seven years. Most people get rid of mortgage insurance within five years. There are easy ways to get rid of mortgage insurance. Buy property because it's a good property and a good deal, not because it has or does not have mortgage insurance because of the loan you qualify for. And stay away from this. Pros know this, noobs do not. Stay away from no mortgage insurance loans when you're putting less than 20% down. All you're doing is you're building mortgage insurance into your interest rate, which you can't get rid of. See, if you have a mortgage uh, that's at say 3% and you have 1% mortgage insurance, you can get rid of that 1% in two years without even having to refinance. You could just request it be removed once you get to 20% equity, 20 to 22% equity. But if you build your mortgage insurance into the rate, and let's say you take a 3.75% rate, but you're like, yeah, it's no mortgage insurance. You can't, you can't get rid of that extra 0.75% or 0.1 or that 1% anymore, whatever it ends up being. You can't get rid of it. It's built into the loan. Big mistake. Don't take a no mortgage insurance loan. Uh, number, let's see, five, six, that, now we're on number seven. Number seven. Get accurate comps. This is not complicated, but it is very annoying sometimes to get a real estate agent to provide you the accurate comps. And it's so very, very important that you ask your agent to provide you accurate comps. Uh, and sometimes it's very frustrating to use Zillow as well to try to find the comps because sometimes Zillow is not accurate and the other websites are confusing. But here's the thing. Anytime you buy property, don't hang your hat on what other people say. Don't rely on an appraiser. Focus on the comps that you can identify. And what you're looking for are properties that are substantially similar to yours and sold substantially recently. I would much rather have one or two really good comps that are similar in size, age, location, and timing than 10 good comps from a year ago. I gotta know what the market is doing today. And what helps me do that? Properties that sold within the last two to six weeks. Those are your hot cakes. Those are your top priorities. And if you're buying in an area that doesn't have a lot of recent sales, that's a risk factor. Pros know that. That's why pro real estate investors invest in areas where there are a lot of sales and a lot of comps because there's density and there are a lot of properties. If you're buying in a very rural space and there aren't a lot of comps, you're creating more risk for yourself. Pros do not like risk. Noobs don't recognize risk. Very important differences. This is why it's also very important when you shop for properties, you look at similar properties. You can't compare a 1,000 square foot house to a 2,000 square foot house. If you've got a 1,000 square foot property you're buying, you've got to look for comps that are between 800 to 1,200 square feet. You got to find properties that are ideally within the same neighborhood, within the same sort of boundaries of main streets and away from funky things like highways or high tension power lines. Those things are just going to make your property much more management intensive. Accurate comps are very key. Then we get to mistake number eight, and that's confusing cash flow for value. There are a lot of people who will buy real estate and not understand this. They will look at, let's say, a duplex or a triplex, and they'll say something like, hey, well, this cash flows, yay, I'm getting a multifamily building, or yay, I'm gonna house hack this property and it's gonna cash flow so well. Problem is, cash flow does not create value. What creates value is getting a cheaper deal than what the entire market is uh, otherwise consistently offering. So here's just an example of this. Here's what people do regularly. They'll say, okay, I'm gonna buy a, let's say $500,000 house in California, and it's going to create $2,500 of rent, which is kind of like the half percent rule, right? Uh, and then they'll go out to, because you know consistently we keep hearing that, oh, the 1% rule, it's the most godly way to invest where your monthly rent is 1% of the purchase price. It depends on the area that you're in, and that's where we're gonna go here. Let's then go and compare to a $500,000 house in let's say Florida. Uh, and let's just say, just for giggles here, now this $500,000 place in Florida rents for, oh, I don't know, $500,000 in Florida, maybe it rents for $5,000. Okay, that's the 1% rule. So oftentimes people look at this and they say, okay, well, this deal in California must be a crappy deal because the cash flow over here in Florida is much better. But remember, cash flow does not define value. Noobs make this mistake. They use these generic stupid rules to determine value and it's completely backwards. Pros understand what creates value. It's not cash flow that creates value, it's relative cash flow. Now that's a little more complicated. 
relative cash flow. Okay, so what does relative cash flow mean? So here's what that might mean. Let's say you have a 10 unit apartment building and each unit rents for $1,000 and this building sells for $1 million. That means every single month you are getting $10,000 of income on a million dollars, which means annually you have $120,000 of rent coming in. $120,000 of rent coming in on a million dollar property. Let's calculate that out really quick. So $1 million, that's all I'm gonna do is take $1 million divided by 120,000. That gives me 8.33. That means I have something known as a gross rent multiplier of 8.33. And so all I did here was take the purchase price and divide it by the gross annual rent and I got 8.33. Okay, cool. So now I have a gross rent multiplier. Well now, let's say there is another 10 unit apartment building that comes up for sale. So a, a totally new listing comes up. It's, it's 10 units and uh, the rent is $10,000 per month, but the price is $1.2 million. Well, this property would have a gross rent multiplier of 10, which is greater than this deal. So this deal was a better deal than this deal, assuming they're in, this, in a similar location. So now what you're doing is they're actually comparing relative rents to an area. And so how, do you, how does a pro determine that they're getting a good deal? Ah, see, that's a good question. So now let's say you've got this. You got a four unit deal, you got a five unit deal, you got a three unit deal, and you got a 10 unit deal. And three of these sold and one is coming up for sale. So we'll say three sold and one is for sale. Okay, so here's kind of what we got broken down. Four unit for sale, uh, sold, five units sold, three units sold, and you've got a 10 unit building that's a for sale now. Great, now we're going to say that Based on the sold properties data, we know that the gross rent multiplier in this area is somewhere between nine and 10. In fact, if we take an average of this, we'll have 28 divided by three. So let's do that really quick. 28 divided by three is 9.33. So you've got an average of 9.33 for your gross rents, and you've got a median, which would be nine. You got this median here of nine. So we know market value for these units, generally you do this on units, not single family, is somewhere between nine and 9.33. Great. So 10 unit apartment building comes up for sale and the market's really hot and you're like, oh my gosh, 10 units, look, it's gonna have so much cash flow. You know what? It's gonna have uh, you know, more than the 1% rule. Everything about it's gonna be freaking awesome. Oh my gosh, I can house hack it, blah, 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 blah. But the gross rent multiplier is 12. Well, 12 is bad because the bigger the number is, the less value you are getting relative to the other deals. So now somebody gets really excited about this 10 unit building, but they're actually way overpaying compared to what the comps are. And you saw how we calculated gross rent multiplier. Now on the flip side, if this deal came up and you calculated it, you looked at this deal and said, wow, they're selling this deal based on really low rents. I can get these rents up by raising the rents. And if I raise the rents to market value and I can buy it at the price they're selling it for, and then I do my gross rent multiplier math, as long as you can actually get those rents up to quality tenants, and then let's say your gross rent multiplier comes in at an eight, now you're getting a below market value deal. Now you're buying this 10 unit building below market value. And again, how do you figure gross rent multiplier? You take what the rents are, uh, and the purchase price, and then you take purchase price divided by gross rents. That's it, it's so simple. And this gives you a relative understanding of value. So just so you can see how a pro can kind of bottom line this, every area is different. A very high quality area where I live, buildings will sell with a 22 times gross multiplier, extremely expensive. Very low quality areas where I live will sell with a gross rent multiplier of around 16 to 17. So now when a high quality property comes on the market and I say, oh my gosh, that's a high quality property and it's selling for 18 times gross, I know that's actually a very good deal. But I'm not going to compare that good deal to wherever this is, where you know their average gross rents are you know, nine to 9.3. So it's all relative to the area where you are buying. 
And that is a huge mistake that noobs make that pros understand. So understand gross rent multiplier, really easy to calculate. Again, you just take sales price divided by gross rents and compare it to what other units are selling for. And then you understand the question is not what is the cash flow? The question is what is the relative value? So this begs the question, should you buy real estate out of the area where you're living? My answer to this is it depends. If you have a really good knowledge of a place, like where I grew up, I know Davie, Florida really well. I could hire a property manager out there and I know I could find a good deal because I know which neighborhoods are good. I've got connections out there and I can make that work. It's a pain in the butt though, because I'd have to fly out there to actually visit the properties and I won't know how well trends are changing. So it's possible and I could get more cash for my dollar. I can get more bang for my buck in Florida than I can here. But I personally find that rather than expend that energy to make that happen, I'm going to take that energy to find below market value deals where I am, which obviously I could find much easier if I'm local and a deal hits the market, I could go to it right away and I could see it and I could fix it up, I can rent it and I could see trends changing. That's a lot easier for me. Next, number nine not understanding the three ways that you can make money in real estate. There are three ways to make money in real estate. Number one, cash flow, which is anything that's left over after you make all of your payments, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, maintenance, management, utilities, reserves, and so on and so forth. But is also principal pay down in some sense, because every single month you own real estate, you are paying off principal, you are building your wealth that way. So number one is really cash flow along with principal pay down. Number two is appreciation. That's you control a $1 million asset. The market goes up 10%. Cool. That's $100,000 of value, right? There's appreciation. And then there's number three, which is buying below market value. Most noobs, when they analyze real estate, they only look at cash flow. When the reality is you have to look at all three. You balance cash flow, appreciation, and your ability to buy below market value. Those are the ways to buy real estate. Okay, as, as long as you know those three things, you can actually go in with, with a better and more proper mindset. Pros know this when they go in and they try to get all three. They buy in areas that are going to appreciate in the long term. They try to buy below market value and they look for as much cash flow as they can get or, you know, coupled with the capacity for having as much bonus principal pay down as possible. Now, the biggest noob mistake of all is noobs wait and pros buy. Noobs will always wait for the next possible opportunity to uh, find a good deal or the next possible market crash or whatever. There is no shortage of excuses that people will give to not buy real estate. And so noobs will say anything like market crash, I gotta get my LLC, I gotta wait for 20% down. Pros don't care about any of this stuff. Pros say, get me some decent cash flow, get me in a good area, get me something below market value, and I'm buying. And there are opportunities like this dime a dozen. Every day there are opportunities available in every market. How do I know that? Because if you're watching this video, I guarantee you there's somebody in your city who's going around flipping real estate. And if you're thinking to yourself, I can't find a deal, how do you think that person would feel if you went up to that person who's flipping real estate and you said, I can't find a deal? They'd probably laugh because they know how to find deals. It's not easy to find deals. Finding deals is one of the reasons that I've recently partnered with Deal Machine. Deal Machine is a great way where you can find deals before they hit the market by taking pictures of properties that you see your fixer uppers and automatically putting them into a system where you follow up and get the owner to know you are ready to buy their property as is if you want or however you want to buy it before it hits the market. You now circumvent the entire real estate process and using Deal Machine makes this ridiculously easy for you to do. I highly encourage you check out Deal Machine in the link down below. It's a great software and it's a program that I'm really excited about uh, using as well and incorporating into sort of my daily marketing to find more deals. Just check out Deal Machine. But remember the big bottom line here between noobs and pros. Pros start, they get in. They realize that there are going to be mistakes. Of course, you could take advice along the way and you could take suggestions along the way. But remember what we've got here. We've got a situation where noobs come in, they rip out everything without considering what they can save. Noobs think credit doesn't matter. Noobs consider only cash flow over location. And noobs are worried about what's behind the walls without realizing that you can inspect and look for clues without having to do damage. 
Noobs look for replacing roofs over roof tune-ups, and noobs are worried about mortgage insurance where pros are worried about value. Noobs don't consider accurate comps where pros do, and noobs confuse cash flow for value. Noobs also don't always understand the three ways to make money in real estate, which pros do. And the biggest of all, pros start. And so if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button. Check out those amazing courses linked down below. Check out Deal Machine, and folks, we'll see you in the next video.